Mimosas with Michael. Mimosas with Michael. Mimosas with Michael. Yay! Hey everybody, uh, it's Michael Colon with Mimosas with Michael. Thank you again for uh, turning in this week. Um, I have a really awesome guest this week, Brent Bailey. How are you? Hello. I didn't know if I was visible or not right now. <laughs> I know it takes a second with like the internet to kind of like bounce back and forth between the. Yes, it, it's going to bounce back to whomever talks. Oh, perfect. Oh, so we're doing, okay. So you're not. We're not in like the double box. We're in the. It's going to be the person speaking is the main frame. It kind of it kind of bounces back. Unbeknownst to the audience, I actually pick when I want it to do both. So um, sneaky. Just so it feels like we're a real show. Right. So um, so let's just start right from the beginning. So most people know you as like the face of the Shell gas station. Sure. So you say you pull up and you 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 want to get gas and you see this good looking guy smiling at you while you're getting gas in a suit. <laughs> Everybody, that's Brent. However, to me, you're just my friend. We. We met eight years ago in Montana filming a movie. Yeah. So it's always weird because I like I go get gas. I'm like, God, why is Brent watching me get gas? I just stare at you while you pump. I know. Like, really like suspicious. Like, are you doing this right? Yeah. And now I'm like, did you go inside and buy snacks? Did you buy yeah. snacks? <laughs> and then now it's like, well, are you wearing a mask? Are you wearing a mask in there? <laughs> oh, that's funny. I hadn't thought yeah. about that one. But yeah, that's a yeah. good point. So Brent, Brent is Shell's mask keeper. Yes. The official yeah. mask keeper. So it's so cool. Um, I'm very proud of you for getting that. Again, like to me, you're just a, like, you're my friend. So I get to see my friend working and they're yeah. like, it's so crazy to see you. But then also you're like on every other freaking commercial. I feel like. Yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm so lucky. I, 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 I feel so grateful that I've stayed so busy in this business uh, and I've worked so consistently that eventually i mean you know how it is like you you shoot a bunch of things in over four years but then they all come out at the exact same time so then it looks like you're just insanely busy and i think that's been the really like fortunate part for me is i just keep working uh, yeah. at like, just a normal regular pace but then things come out so fast like i mean with the shell thing obviously that's so much at the same time in your face because it's at every single gas station yeah. Uh, so then if I'm doing anything on top of that, it seems like, how does this guy have any time? But like that print ad that we shot for Shell, like we did that like a year and a half ago. So okay. it's like, well, I mean, it seems like I'm still super busy with Shell. We did just do a whole new campaign, which I'm really excited about. And that's oh. where like the snacks are coming from. Um, so that's going to start airing in the next month or two. But yeah, okay. I, just, I feel very, very lucky. And I, it's kind of true because like we because I scripturize, I direct, I write. And so yeah. everyone's like, you're so busy, but like I'll have 10 projects come out at one time, but they've been done over a span of like a year. Sure. So it's, it's, it's just so interesting. Like I'll become a breakout star, but it's, I spent 15 years getting there. Exactly. That's always the funny part is people are like, Oh my gosh, it was overnight. And you're like, no, no, I've been doing this yeah. for, you know, 16 years. Yeah. If you look at my new page, you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. I guess you have been, but like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. People in middle America don't understand that. They're just like, they just, I don't know what they think, but it's, it's like, they don't realize like there's all this behind the scenes stuff that you're doing. They sure. don't see you auditioning. They don't see you prepping lines and then not getting the job. They, they don't see all that work. Yeah. They just see like, yeah. They just see yeah. you as like the spokesperson for shell, but they don't realize that like you had to do 20 commercials and like 150 auditions. You know, you know, book the roles. Cause I, Case in point, this is a good tie into you and I met on Crimson Winter, right. which was the movie we shot in Montana. But most people don't realize that, like, I'm from Southern California where it's warm and yeah. we have palm trees. We shot that movie. I don't remember if you were in the first portion of the. I can't remember if you were the second portion or the first portion. That's a great question. I don't. I just know the portion I was there for, but I don't know if it was the first or second. I know that I stepped off that airplane and it was like negative eleven degrees, and yeah. then I found out we were doing overnights exterior in a cave and i think a little part of me died in montana oh we you did all the cave stuff so you were there for the second half yeah i was, was in there it, when like, brian was 
I don't know, hopefully this doesn't like anybody in trouble, but I was there when they were, they were wrapping it and then putting like the lighter fluid on it in the cave. And then it was so smoky that he would oh. come out. He was like coughing up like black soot. Yes. And that was the second was, half. And then Brian is so, he's so method and he's so, he gets so into it that the, the corn syrup that we were drinking, because we were vampires, obviously. So the corn syrup we were drinking is blood. Yeah. I, I would do the fake actor sip where I'd put it up and I would pretend like I drank it, but it would just be on my lips. Yeah. But Brian was like, no, I'm drinking it. And he drank so much of that combined with the smoke inhalation that he felt so sick at the end of that night. And I, I remember that. Yeah. So bad for it. So, it, our, so we did it the first time in February. So okay. I, was in Mont- I was in Montana. So my birthday is in February. I was there for my birthday, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But like the producer called me and he's like, look, so we're filming outside in the snow in February in Montana. Yeah. Do you have the right clothing? And I was like, oh yeah, I got stuff because I don't fucking know. Right. I'm from Southern California. So I had all the right. warm stuff. I get there. Our very first day was outside. It was negative nine. No, I think it was just nine degrees. I wasn't ready. Yeah. The producer, all the producers, because they were all college friends, they had to like rally together and they had to start giving us California people like snow clothes. I believe it. Yeah. Like I had no idea. I mean, eventually after like the second week, I had to go get my own stuff. Wait, so when was the, because I was there when it was snowing too, because remember we made a snowman. Uh, But when was the second part? Was the second part when it wasn't snowing? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So we went back in March or May. One of those M months, and it rained and was windy the entire time. Gotcha. So I must have been there the first time. I actually think I was there for your birthday. Because weren't you guys all at that house? Yes. Yeah. We were the, yeah we had, okay. See, guy, it was just so the audience knows, this was eight years ago. <laughs> and we both have terrible memories. So here's, now I have to tell you something. This is what's really funny. So I have a twin sister. I don't know if you remember this. I don't. So I have a twin sister, and I was like, thank God I'm going to be in Montana for my birthday. I don't have to share it with anybody. Yeah, okay, this does sound familiar. And then I was so pissed because one of the crew members is like, oh, I get to be in Montana for my birthday. My birthday Wasn't it Dorit? February. I think. No, Dorit's birthday's in February. Okay. But it's not my day. Gotcha. It was just but, close. Yeah, but there was, uh, there was an older gentleman. I don't remember. His name was Will. He kind of had a beard and he wore a okay. hat all the time. His birthday, same day as mine. I was like, are you fucking serious? You like. You got I know. I was like, I finally come to this place where there's like, I can have my own birthday. And he's like, oh yeah, birthdays. So I don't know if you remember, but there ended up being like two separate birthdays. Like, I vaguely remember. So we were in the same house. So we kind of started, no, we started at different bars because yeah. you know, he's a little bit older. So we wanted two different. And then we kind of coalesced at the same bar. And then we kind of went back to the house. It was, nice. a very, it was one of the best birthdays, but it was just like, what are the chances? Yeah. That is really I'm funny. two states away. Yeah, that was that was a uh, that was a tough film and in a good way. I mean, I will tell you, my first week there, I had altitude poison. I, I was so sick the first week, like it just because the altitude was different. It was so cold. Yeah. my body did not adjust well at all the first week. Um, I don't remember. The- I don't remember how long I was there. I don't even really remember how big of a. I know my character's name was Fergus, and I think it was a pretty small role in the first one. And it was supposed to be a trilogy. And I was supposed to get bigger as as the oh, okay. movies went along, but then I just don't think the movies ever went along. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I never worked on the second ones if they never did it. I don't think they did. I know Brian, if I remember correctly, Brian moved here. A lot of those people moved to LA. Yeah. Brian and Brandon both moved to LA for a while. Uh, and Brian used to come over and hang out and I've seen him actually quite a few times. And then Brandon also came over quite a few times because we have a mutual friend named Aaron Brents, which is how I got linked into that whole group to begin with. Uh, okay. But I think they've all now moved back to Montana. There was a young girl, Caitlin, that moved down here. She was one of the leads. And then okay. one of the crew members, Jack, who's our second AD, moved down here. And Damn it was cool. really funny because I actually knew his girlfriend. I didn't realize they were together. And she and I were friends. And then one day, her Jack just shows up. And I was like, uh, hi? <laughs> it was, and he's like, I just moved down here like a few years ago. It was just the randomest thing. That's yeah, LA is it. the, it's, it's a big place, but it's the smallest town, especially like in the entertainment industry. It's crazy. Oh God, without a doubt. So, but now I want to, I want to catch up with you. I haven't seen you in so long. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we've decided the last time I saw you was on that movie set. So yeah, it's been forever. Yeah, it's crazy. It's been eight years. Although we have kept in touch. Like you've yeah. helped me cast a few things. You've 
you've, I think you've given me feedback on scripts and movies. So I've always been grateful for that. Right. Cause but, you did your horror project, which I can't remember who did you end up choosing for the, it was like on the side of the road and they were in a car and something terrible happens. Or am I making all I, this up? No, you're not making it up, but I, for the life, I mean, that was probably 15. I don't remember who I chose now. Okay. I, think I will I research to pick you, Joanna Sotomora. I think that sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know that I ever know who you or knew who you actually chose. One, I don't remember who I chose. Two, two, I don't remember what the project is. Okay, well, okay. Sidebar for the audience. When, when we're yeah. done, I will look that project up and let you know. Perfect. But I would love, I'd love to work with you again. Um, I'd yeah. love to direct you because I think you're awesome. Thank you. That'd be amazing. And then I'll write something for you. But yeah. with that in mind, are you working on anything recently? I feel like I've seen you post about some stuff. Yeah, I just got done working on that show, Lucifer. Um, oh my God, it's one of my favorite shows. I love that show. Yeah, so I have a fun role on that, uh, just one episode on there. And then I actually, this is the funny thing, uh, I have four movies, four features in post-production. Um, okay. A horror film called The Stairs, which we just shot in Seattle last year. Oh, I um, shot a movie in Seattle? I love Seattle. Yeah, it was really fun. I mean, it was hard and it rained a lot. And, you know, that made it, a lot of our shoot was in the woods. And so it was very difficult, but we, we pulled it off. Uh, Peter Drago is the director. He was amazing. Um, but then I have another movie, uh, like about, I'm an MMA fighter. That's called Twisted Blues. Um, I, the title is so strange, but I think it's gonna be funny. It's like a psychological thriller slash like kind of horror. And it's called Deadly Sugar Daddy. And I get to be the Deadly Sugar Daddy. Nice. So that's exciting. And that's then gonna be fun. There, there's a fourth one that I can't think of, but I shot these all like the Twisted Blues one I shot three or four years ago. Uh, it's just yeah. in post-production. It takes a long time, but hopefully it's all going to work out where I, I think pending coronavirus, uh, they're all supposed to be with released within the year. Oh, and the last one's called break even, which is kind of like an action heist movie. Uh, we shot that here and then in oh, nice. and then in Ventura. Nice. Okay. So most of them have been local then. Yeah. Most of them have been pretty local. I mean, uh, Twisted Blues was actually in Dubai. So the opposite of local, uh, which was amazing. So I guess that's, that's sort of a lie. It's half and half. Um, the stairs was Seattle. Twisted Blues was Dubai. Um, Deadly Sugar Daddy was here. And then break even was like here, Ventura and Catalina. I, I think I remember you going to Dubai. Dubai I was like amazing. I, I think it was, I want to say it was like, maybe four years ago now. And it was, uh, I mean, I don't know that I would have ever picked, I mean, I would, I love Dubai and I'm glad I went, but I probably wouldn't have been on my, my short list. Um, but now that I've gone, I'm so excited because they, they're just, it's unreal. Like the cars that you see, the Burj Khalifa is incredible. We went up to the top as high as you can go. And this building like sways in the wind and you're at an yeah. unreal height. Like it almost gives you vertigo and you feel a little bit motion sick. And then you kind of like get settled in. But then we did like a red dune safari where you're just going through these insane sand dunes and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have like all this traditional food and there's like fire dancers. I mean, it, it was awesome. There were like hawks in the hotel room that you got to hold, or not the hotel room, but like the hotel lobby. Um, there's so much stuff to do. I went snowboarding inside the Dubai mall, which, why, why is there a mountain in a mall? But right? were, it had two, like an actual chairlift and it had two runs. I mean, it was crazy. That's, um, yeah, now I kind of want to go. Yeah, I mean, just for the experience of like, everything is so much bigger and more impressive because they're, they're like, they're always trying to one-up themselves. Apparently, like the next tallest building is being built in uh, Abu Dhabi. And so Abu Dhabi. Dubai, I guess, is already building the next, next tallest building. Isn't that crazy? I'd love to go to Abu Dhabi as well. I mean, Dubai is on my list. Yeah, of course. I'm obsessed with traveling. I'll go anywhere. But besides Dubai, have you shot? Have you shot anywhere else outside of the country? Yeah, I shot a Taco Bell commercial in Chile. Uh, okay. Which was so strange, but I guess for some reason it was it was cheaper to do it there. I think uh, for like crew and then some of the talent was local hire, and so it was cheaper. I shot a, a Corona commercial in Tulum. Okay. Um, because of that like famous beach that you're always on. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've shot elsewhere. Maybe not. Oh, I shot um, a commercial for Lexus in Canada, which was nice. Fun. Okay. But I think that's the three. I got offered a role um, for 
a project in Mexico that I didn't end up being able to take because it was conflicting with another one of my jobs. But that's one of the best parts about our business is you get to go so many places that you never would have gone. And I mean, I got to, when I shot LBJ, um, the movie that Rob Reiner directed with Woody Harrelson, I got to live in uh, New Orleans for five weeks while we shot. And that's it. Just good grief. It was amazing. We had so much fun. So uh, that's like the best part about this. And I got to shoot a movie in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a vacation. Obviously, you're working, but you always have downtime. Uh, and so well, you could crew doesn't. Crew doesn't true. as much. Yeah, it's exactly. a little, It's weird because like, like I shot a movie for five weeks in Jamaica, oh, which God. was beautiful. Which was beautiful, except that we were in like Kingston, so we were in like the main city. Right. But we just. It seems like we spent our entire time filming. That's true. Like, I have off days, whereas you guys are literally on every single day. Yeah, but the weird thing is, is like, I'm still going to places in jamaica that i've never been to right like yeah. we filmed on the beach so i'm still on the beach even though i'm working it's like you know so it, it's i try to look at it like that as like yeah i have off days but i'm also like between the hotel and the location i get to look at stuff i've never seen right and i'm in a place like i would never even ever be at probably if i was filming in the state or country anyways right because like yeah, the, the hotels are always nicer than i would ever put myself up at yeah you're like yeah I'm not mad at that. So again, like yeah. I get to travel and it's true. And if, and if you're smart, like um, when I travel abroad, like I'll, I'll extend it a few days. Yeah. Just be like, like they, all they have to do is fly you back. They don't have to, you can choose when. So you're like, Hey, I know I'm working for five weeks. Can I just take another five days and just right. stay and explore? And I kind of like that because for a crew, and I guess even if you're a director or whatever, if you have a significant other or family, like that's the time that they could come. Because yeah. you've been gone for so long, it's like come and we can spend this week, and you and then it's you already have a flight, so it's pretty easy. I don't know. That's one thing I love about this industry is being able to travel. Yeah, I did that with my uh, the the person I was dating at the time. This uh, her name's Erin Mulvey, and I flew her out to Dubai because I was there for five weeks, and so I was like, come, let's do every single adventure on my days off. Yeah, uh, and that's so the smart. best part is because now you can spend all your money on adventures because you're not spending any money on the hotel and you're not spending any money on the flights. I mean, obviously, I had to pay for her flight. Her. Yeah, but, but that's just yeah, just a one flight. Yeah, just one person. Yeah, and it was shockingly not that expensive. I bought the ticket for her to Dubai like three days before she came, and it was like seven hundred dollars, which I thought for sure it was going to be like three thousand dollars. Thousand seven hundred on what airline? Lufthansa. Oh, nice. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it was fine. That's the same flight we took out there. And there was like that stop in Frankfurt, which was brutal because it's like right in the middle of the trip. And it's, I guess, the second longest flight from California. I think the first longest is Melbourne. Um, oh, Australia. It takes like, 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 half, like a day and a half. Like right? a day. Yeah. And I think it took us 23 hours with our layover, which by the time you get there, you're so jet lagged and it was brutal. But luckily, and they're probably five like, weeks, you have time. Yeah. And they're probably, what? A day and a half ahead or something? I think it was, I want to say it was 18 hours ahead. Yeah. Because I, I went to the, I, I was in the Philippines and it's 15 hours there and it's 15 hours ahead. So it's like, you basically miss a day of your life. Yeah, maybe it was 12. I remember like when I was trying to have conversations with people that were still in Los Angeles, it was tough because as they were waking up, I was going to bed and as I was going to bed, they were waking, they were waking up. up. So it was, it was always really challenging. Yeah. I, I, I it's crazy. But that's what's interesting about traveling is it's like I leave on a Friday, I'll land on a Sunday, even though for me it's been 15 hours, 30 hours has passed. Yeah. Calendar wise, it's weird. But then if you, what's it? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say if you worked it out right and you did it on your birthday, you could almost have two birthdays. Or if you did it on New Year's Eve, you could almost have two New Year's Eve. Two Eves. years. I know. Yeah. I love That's a good idea. But flying back, it's almost like you gain. Cause you gain it. So like, if you leave at like six in the afternoon, you almost right. spend it like four in the afternoon. It's like you get, it, it's like so time weird. travel. <laughs> yeah. It's the coolest thing. Yeah. So I, I love our industry. So you've been acting for like ever. I feel yeah. Like I started this- uh, when I turned 22, I'm 37 now. So uh, whatever that comes up to like 15, 16 years ish. Uh, so we've been doing this about the same time. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, yeah. I started about 15 years ago. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, wow. before that, I actually, I didn't go to school for acting. I went to a school for computers. I got my bachelor's in uh, computer information systems, and I got my master's in business. And I oh, was yeah. a computer programmer for like four or five years. Um, and then you're like, screw this. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things where the, like, the job I had at the time, I didn't love. Um, and I couldn't, like I am 
much more social now than I ever was when I was younger, but still living in a cube and only talking to a computer for like 40 to 60 hours a week, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, it oh, yeah. It would just seem depressing. I mean, I'm so grateful that so many people do because they make so many amazing things. But for me personally, like I got in trouble because I we weren't allowed to have um, AOL Instant Messenger at the time. That was like the platform that people were using to talk on. Yeah. And so I developed my own instant messaging app and sent it, like, sent it to some other people. And then I got in trouble for that because they're like, no, the whole reason we're not letting you use instant messenger is because you're not supposed to be talking. And I was like, ugh. So then I would just like peek over my cube and talk to people and I got in trouble for that. I got in trouble. I, I, get, I felt dude, sleep I used, cube once. Oh, I used to get in trouble too because I used to have fun at work. Yeah. But I, I mean, you've, you've been on set with me. Like I'm so naturally friendly. Like I love yeah. people. I excel around like that energy if people are like, this is work, you're not supposed to be talking. And I was like, uh, why? Yeah. I don't, I don't think people ever understood that. Like when I ask why, they're like, I mean, you just can't. And I'm like, yeah, but why? Like, and I get it. Like if you're, there are some sets I've been on where it's like, hey man, we're like, this is an ambitious shoot. We, we probably aren't going to make the days unless we are hustling like crazy. So we can like minimize the crosstalk and everybody talk at a quieter level so that the people that need to be talking to each other can actually hear each other. Like I get it when there's that, but I've also yeah. got trouble on set too for, for having a good time with the other cast members in between takes. And it's tough because as, especially as an actor, you want to keep that energy up and you want to make sure that uh, yeah. everything's staying like fresh and that like everybody's having a good time because then it helps the performance on screen. But we always, you know, sometimes forget that when we're off camera, that's when everybody else, everybody else is the crew is doing all the work and they really need to be able to hear each other. So it's yeah. tough. So we learned that, like, especially on the stairs, we learned that if, when we wanted to go off and have our conversations and make jokes and try to keep the energy up, we just had to do it from like a safe distance. So we weren't affecting everybody else's job. That's actually, that's actually true because, and it's great if like when the actors get along, cause you have that chemistry, right. but then you guys are like laughing and joking and having fun. And it's like grips are trying to move heavy equipment around you and yeah. they're trying to talk to each other and the DPs. And it's like, they're always trying to, Talk over. I remember I worked with this actress one time. It was one of her first movies, and she was a theater person. And so she used to sing a lot. It just singing was her thing. Yeah. And the crew, and she wasn't a bad singer, but the crew sometimes was like, "Shut up!" or trying to work. So yeah. I finally told, and I finally told her because we became friends. I go, "Honey, can you sing over there?" <laughs> and she's like, right. and, and she's like, and, and it was funny because she never met any disrespect by it. It's just like, what's her way of concentrating? Right. So I totally get that. Yeah. Plus, after a while, like when you spend what 12 13 hours day after day like you kind of just talk to everybody like yeah. i have actors at video village that sit and we become friends that's how you and i happened right and it's just one of those things where you just like you all become family in that sense yeah i mean you you you're, you're, you're not you have shifted into a new life that like this is all you do you hang out with these yeah. people all day long and when you're done you go home for me i memorize my lines for the next day and then i go to sleep so this yeah. is my only like communication with any outside world yeah and I think just as, as people were generally just love to communicate and feel like, I mean, and, and when you have a good rapport with people, it, it really can show on camera. Right. I think. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, depending on the type of movie you're doing, but yeah, I think it's important. True. I think um, it's something so, like really dark and scary and you're supposed to hate each other. You probably shouldn't be getting along, but. Well, okay. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. You know, I guess it depends. Everybody has their, their sort of style. Their process. Yeah. yeah, I've seen. I mean, of all the movies I've done, I've seen all kinds of actors and all kinds of like. Some, I mean, it's interesting when when actors don't get along, but on camera they have to get along, and right, or when they get along and on camera they can't. It's such a we. I love it. I love yeah. this industry, man. I really do. I've been, I've read about that quite a few times. Where like uh, some like on big movies where like the two leads don't get along and they have to fake it, and the the crew. Yeah. It's always the crew that, like, you end up reading and, like, hearing about them talking about, like, how awkward it was on set because, like, mm -hmm. either it was so bad that the actors don't even actually act against each other. They act against each other's um, stand-ins or photo doubles. Isn't that crazy? they cannot be in the same room. And you're like, man, you just made this movie so much harder because now you don't even get to have the real performance with the person because you can't even stand them. So, I hear some, I big, some, big, some big actors just do that anyways. I feel like... I've heard like, that. And that's the shit. I can name some names about I want to on air. Right. But, but it's always like, like just when it's my close-up, I'll do my thing, and then I'll be in my trailer when it's not. And I'm always right. like, that's such a weird thing because it's still a pro – just because you're not on camera doesn't mean you should still be acting. It's, it's Right. 
you know, I, I mean, I've worked, I, I also won't name names, but I've worked with one particular person that uh, they only would read off cue cards. They refuse to memorize lines. Oh, I can already tell you who I know it is. Yeah, I think everybody in the town knows who it is. But so yeah. we're, we like, we would be doing a scene together and he would be reading off of the cue card behind me, not even really looking at me. But for the camera's purposes, it looked like we're having a scene together. Yeah. I was like, okay, so only cue cards. And then I know yeah. other people just do the... Uh, the earpiece. I even hear, yeah. heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I heard Robert Downey Jr. did the earpieces for the Iron Man's. Oh, really? And I'd be really curious because he's so brilliant and it's so easy for him. Well, it looks so easy. Uh, yeah. And a lot of it even seems like it's improv because it, it does seem so natural that I, it seems like that would be really challenging. Unless, like, I wonder what the cue is. If they're actually saying a line and he's like, cool, heard it, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, or I would be really curious to see like how close it was. I'm gonna. I've never worked with them. I'll see if I can ask around. Now I'm intrigued. That's it. That's good to know. I think that'd be an incredible talent to be able to to act with an earpiece in and not know what your lines were until somebody was feeding them to you. That'd be so weird. That'd be amazing. And then they cut like because they'll just cut that space out when he's not. Acting. Sure. So interesting. You know, and it tying into that, it's very interesting because. As a script supervisor, there's times when, like, let's say we're doing, you're doing a phone call and we're, like, we're doing your side in the house and then later. So there's times that, like, as a script supervisor, I've had to do off-screen dialogue. Right. Like, to help or with if, like, Yeah, for the timing. And it's always interesting because I, I'm not a trained actor, but I try to give as, mu as, a mo as much as I can. So at least right. you're acting against somebody, even though I'm probably, like, around the hall or on the other side of the room. Yeah, but it's but it's so interesting, like when you're acting against a stand-in, because even though the stand-in tries to act, it's not the same. Right, it's a different it's performance. Really, it's not. Yeah, the energy is different. <clears throat> it's so strange. In so, a weird way, it could. I could almost see how it could be harmful because if you're bringing this like amazing performance with your own thoughts and your own ideas, but they're so different than what the other person's going to do, it would almost cause it that if I'm truly listening to you and truly responding to what you're giving me, yeah, it could almost be it, that it doesn't make sense anymore. Because now it's two separate performances. And obviously, mm -hmm. if you're talking to me one way versus another person talking to me another way, I'm going to respond in two different ways. Well, and that's the thing, because acting is also reacting. So sometimes, right. if you watch movies, sometimes they're not even on the person talking. They might be, like, on you reacting. Right. There might be something that's, that you're giving as an actor that's really, like, shows what they're saying more. Like, if they're giving you bad news right. and your face is, like, crestfallen, that's a good moment story-wise. Mm -hmm. And it's just, like... If, if the other person isn't giving you that new, how do you like show that look without being like the actor isn't giving you anything to work with? I mean, there's so many things about it. Like I, I, we was, I was with my, one of my best friends who actually was the reason I got into the business and his name's Harley J. And we were talking about like the Avengers movies and the Harry Potter movies and everything that's done on green screen. Cause the oh, last, uh, since coronavirus is here, the last shoot for Shell, we had to do more green screen stuff just for safety. Yeah. And I was like, man, it's a different world. Like, and I was only pretending I was at a gas station. <clears throat> yeah. I was like, but these people that like, you're, you're pretending that like fire is coming at you or aliens are there or like transformers are standing there talking to you, but nothing is there. Yeah. Like, I don't think people understand how challenging different. that is and how good of an actor you have to be to make this fake universe seem real. Yeah. And, and so let's think about like the first Harry Potter. So first of all, all these kids are probably what? 10 or 11. Oh, yeah, they were super young. Most, yeah, and so, that you know, it's not like they, they teach you how to work on green screen. So right. here they are, you know, like the guy that plays Hagrid is supposed to be a giant. Mm -hmm. The guy that plays him isn't. And, you know, and then there's dragons, there's all kinds of creatures, and it's like they're probably acting to either like a fake head or a tennis ball on a stick. Right. Right? And it's like how do you, how do you mo tell a child you have to be scared of that dragon and it's really just a small ball? And I it's all great, though. I will say, like, when you're a kid, it's funny because as adults, I think we usually, uh, we try to, to make sense of everything. And so we're like, wait a second, I, I, why would the dragon be here? What, what's the dragon doing? Whereas a kid, you're like, yeah, there's a dragon. I'm terrified. Like, you, oh. you, it's so much easier to go in, like, that make-believe land oh, that than it is, like, as an adult. Because I think we just start to try to, like, rationalize and, and make more sense of things. True, and kids start, I live in that sort of fantasy world. So. Yeah, I remember like when I was a kid, I'd run around and we would pretend we were the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and we would like have battles with the Foot Clan. And it was like, and it felt, and it it felt, felt real. Yeah. yeah, and and there wasn't like a part where you felt silly doing it. You were just like, no, like we're playing pretend right now. And I don't yeah. know at what point we lose that when we turn into adults. I know. I wish <laughs> we didn't lose it. I, I yeah. want that back. Yeah. Now it is. So um, I know this is not so weird, but we're basically running out of time. 
It was very fast. It was so fast. I know. I try to keep it 30 minutes, but it's not, it's not a set rule. So if you have anything else you want to talk about, I'm totally down. I mean, dude, I haven't talked to you in a long time. So this is not catch up for me. The yeah, this could be a five-hour podcast. <laughs> I'm fine with that. The um, audience may not be, though. <laughs> right. They've already, I think they've already clicked out. <laughs> no, no, no. 30 minutes is actually pretty good because you can cover a lot. Uh, and this is, I have to say, it's probably the first time I haven't talked that much. So, oh, well, you're, very, you know. you're a very interesting person. I made a conscious effort that they don't listen to the podcast just for me. Yeah. But what I like is I want it to be a conversation rather than just like, like I'm interviewing and you're droning on. Because I, people, I think that's when they tune out. Right. But here they're like, damn, these people haven't talked in eight years. Like such, they have such great stories. Right. And it's true. Like all that cave stuff I completely forgot about. Yeah, the cave stuff was intense. Um, I don't know. It was uh, so fucking cold on that movie. It was brutal. We, I mean, we had the, the hand warmers in, the toe warmers in, and I still was freezing. You know, the good news is I remember the very first day um, we did it, I was, I thought I was going to die. But after the month we were done, the very last two nights were like the longest night shoots. Right. So we had complete, complete night shoots the very last two nights. It was probably negative 15 or something. And it was snowing. And I was like, oh. But by that time, I had sort of adjusted. You built up a tolerance. Yeah. And I, but that's crazy to think because looking back on it those first few days, if you told me that that's how we were starting out, I wouldn't have survived. Yeah. I, no think, way. I, I think when I stepped off the plane, I thought my lungs were going to freeze. It was that yeah. cold. Yeah. It was crazy. Right. Um, I don't know. know. What do you want to do? Well, we could do like a quick rapid fire question and then we could call it. What do you got? Yeah, but I, I have one quick story to tell you that I don't know if you ever heard this, but that house okay. we stayed in was haunted. I don't know if I ever I told did you hear, this. I heard somebody mention that. I think we even talked about it while I was at the house, but I didn't know to what detail and what length. It was just, there was one night I remember like, because I had like, if you went up the stairs, there was like four bedrooms because we we're in this big like kind of Victorian mansion. Right. I was in the room like straight ahead. And there was a moment where like I was lying there and I was trying to go to sleep and I remember I kind of rolled over and I felt this cold hand on my arm nope. and then like the bed shook. And so did like, I had like these wooden shutters. They all shook at one time. And I was like, mm, fuck this. I ran down the stair. It was terrifying. That is and I remember, very like, scary. Yeah. So did I mean, you, that was just. Did you find a new room or did you continue to sleep in there? I, that was early on. I continued to sleep in that room. Wow. Uh, I do remember, I do remember. Um, the night of my birthday, because I had this massive bed, and we all got drunk and kind of just passed out in it, like every which way. Yeah. And then I remember Dorit, uh, I wonder if she remembers this story. Dorit woke up the next morning, and I kind of rolled over, and I looked at her, and she's like, oh, she's like, I think there's somebody in your room. She's like, I felt a cold hand on my leg. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've, we've met already. Like, it was That's crazy. the spirit from earlier. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, um, my gosh. Yeah. But cause there was no other rooms available. See, and I wasn't at your guys' house. I was over, I think, at Brandon Day's house. Yes. Which was yeah, I think, the, I, I think he was one of the other, like, producers. producers. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, I don't know if I have any questions. You want to do rapid questions? Yeah, you don't have any. I don't know. I'm really good at this, but I don't, I don't know what – I just want you to know if you have anything you want to talk about. Uh, What's your favorite color? I mean, as far as, like, work plug stuff, I mean, we already kind of talked about it. The movies yeah. that I've got coming out and then break even, uh, I guess. Nobody ever saw it. It makes me so sad because LBJ was such a good movie. So everybody should go check out LBJ. Rob Reiner directed it. Woody Harrelson is in it. I think right now it's free on Amazon Prime. And oh, I we play, can put a link in the, in the show notes. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I play yeah. Uh, uh, the speechwriter named Ted Sorensen. Uh, it was so much fun working with Woody. It was like a dream. I got to be in New Orleans. Uh, I made a bunch yeah. of great friends. Michael Stahl David's in it. Michael nice. Mosley's in it. Um, so, it, yeah. I mean, Jennifer Jason Lee's in it. It's, it's such an incredible cast. There's like Bill Pullman, uh, Jeffrey oh. Donovan. So it's amazing to me that nobody, nobody ever knew it came out. We premiered at TIFF. Um, oh, really? In 2016, I think. But it was just, I mean, like, everybody was so drained politically, um, and there just wasn't a lot of advertising for it. So the movie never really got as much exposure as it should have. And it was also, I think, the same year that Woody did Three Billboards, and that got so much press it's, that I think yeah. it overshadowed it. And unfortunately, that, that was, yeah. um, All the Way also came out with Brian Cranston, I think, as we were filming. And they're both movies about LBJ. So I think people were like, well, we already saw an LBJ movie. But uh, it's really that, good, so everybody should check it out. Okay, we'll send it. Um, is, it an, is there a role that you wanted to play that you haven't played? 
Man, I've been so close so many times for a superhero role. Uh, I've tested, I I tested for The Flash. I tested for uh, Legends of Tomorrow. And I've gotten so close. And David Rappaport's the greatest casting director ever. And he's so kind. And he brings me in. Um, and I've wanted to be a superhero so bad. The closest I got <clears throat> was he put me in Doom Patrol. I play a character named Doug that's uh, the boyfriend of, um, well, her name at the time I think is Karen, but it's the it's Diane, oh gosh, what is her last name? Diane Ag- Aguero, or I forget, but she has, like a, her special powers, she has like 60 personalities, and I play like one of her love interests. Oh, fun. Um, but that's what I really want. I want, I would kill to do, uh, you know, The Flash or Superwoman or, or Supergirl, I guess it's called. Uh, oh, one of those CW I, shows? Any of those CW shows I would be so game for. Um, you have a very CW vibe. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I, I just, they, there's, I think those are so fun to watch and they're, uh, they're so interesting. I know there are a ton of, ton of work. I think even Ruby Rose left Batwoman because she, she was like, this is so much more work than I thought it was going to be. So I don't know that I need to lead one of those shows, but I would love yeah. to be like in one of the ensemble ones. You know, I, and I try to get him on the show, but I know Jordan Calloway. Uh, I did a movie with him and we became friends and he's on, um, he's going to be so mad at me. He's on one of those CW shows, Black Lightning. Yeah, is that what it is? It, is that right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay, I'm so bad, but uh, I love him on the show, and he loves it. So yeah, and I, I did a promo thing for the CW. So I did work with Ruby. She's great. I have heard it's very exhausting. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, if you're the lead of a show that, that's already difficult, and if it's an hour long, it's even harder. And then if it's a superhero show with stunt sequences and fights and I mean, yeah, the it's, it's an insane yeah, it's of work, uh, which trust me, I would be so grateful and I would, I would that would be my new life. Yeah. But obviously I'd like to have the best of both worlds where you're, you know, the ensemble cast and you get to just come hang out and you're not like number one on the call sheet. Yeah. That way it's just like kind of chill. You don't have to carry the show. You're just like, I just get to wear my costume and be badass. Yeah. I just get to have fun. I get to come in do my job and then leave, but I don't, yeah. like, you know, have to be there 700 hours a week. Yes. Like yeah. Well, I, I think it'll happen. I have faith in you. I've, I've been following your career for years, but we're friends. So that's probably why. Well, thank you. Um, when COVID hits, or, no, I'm sorry, when COVID ends, ends or we can open up, I'd love to get together again and catch up. Yes, um, let's do it. Cause it's, I can't believe it. How have we not hung out in eight? That's crazy to me. I mean, that shows time, you how Time goes by so fast in Los Angeles. It's like we're in a weird, like time slip. Yeah. Well, know. it's interesting. The first week, Maybe the first two weeks of when we had the initial shutdown, it felt so surreal because not only were we on like in the middle of a global pandemic and we were shut down, but it was cold, overcast that week. We had a full moon. We had Friday the 13th. Right. Like it was like the weirdest. I'm like, how is this? Now, here we are a month later. We're used to it. But I, yeah. when we first happened, I looked at my friend and I was like, how is this our life? Right. This is where we are right now. Yeah, it definitely, uh, I think it, the, the positive side of it is I do know a lot of people that it, like it actually gave them some more time to step back and evaluate their lives and evaluate what they were doing to see if they were happy. And I know people that have actually made career changes and also moved out of the city. Yeah, because they were like, oh, now that I've had a second to breathe and step back, I can actually be like, no, this isn't making me happy. And that's kind of cool that it gave us a little bit of a reset. But anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, for all the people that are out of work that are like struggling now and all the people that got sick and all the people that have died, it's so awful. And I, I hope yeah. we can get past it soon or at least, you know, get somewhat close to a vaccine or. I mean, it, a lot of people have been, it's like weird. They're like, well, I'm home. I might as well work out. I right. did not take that. Uh, but I've been writing, like, I've always been a writer, you know that, but I've been like insane writing and my writing partner and I are like even beasts. So like, even though we're on in the middle of a pandemic, I'm like slammed. Like, it's like, I have project after project. Yeah, that's great. Like, it's I insane. Did, I did not work out <laughs> and I gained like 15 pounds. Uh, and then the gyms opened briefly. So into the gyms and I got like back into a little bit of a routine and now I've been better about working out at home. Good. Well, you look great. Uh, you've been posting all those fun little pictures of like you around the room. <laughs> yeah. That, that was so that funny. was my pandemic boredom. I was like, I'm gonna just start pretending like I'm hanging out with people, and this just they're, happens to be me. They're a lot of fun. I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, please keep in touch. Everybody can find you. It's just Brent Bailey, right? I feel like you're really Brent easy to find. M Bailey. Yeah, for like Brent Michael Bailey. So it's uh, <laughs> at Brent M Bailey, and that's on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and then 
possibly even that's how you find me on IMDb, but that's the easiest Again, way to follow along with the career. We'll link all that. But I, I just want to say that I love that your middle name is Michael, best name ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll get room mimosas. I don't know if you're a drinker, but we're definitely going to get room mimosas in person. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, you know, I enjoy my drinks. I, I'm more of a whiskey guy and a beer guy, but uh, I try to also limit it because when you're not working out and you're drinking, it's not good. Yeah. And I'm telling you, my, gut, my love for whiskey filming in Montana. Oh, nice. And there's, here's a fun story, and then I promise we'll wrap the show up so it's not a okay. four-hour show. But um, because it was so freaking cold every day at lunch. So I don't know if you remember, Brandon's father was our cook. Yes, because I was staying show. at his house. Yes. And so every day at lunch, they, you would just go down the line. This is pre-COVID. So you just everybody it was like a buffet. Right. Get your food, you get your food, food, food. You know, but at the very end, you get your shot of whiskey because that's what kept you warm. I had a shot of whiskey. That. I remember that. Every day at lunch, we'd have one shot of whiskey. And then every night when we wrapped, they would give us dinner there. Yeah. And then at the very end of dinner, they would have cases of beer. I think it's because my days were so short that I don't think I was ever there for lunch or the end of day. So I missed oh, out on the whiskey. You did. But it, it taught me a lot. I mean, even when I was celebrating for my birthday, I was out every day, whiskey, whiskey. I mean, I drank a lot of whiskey when I was there. Yeah. So um, we'll have to go grab whiskey. That'd be great. Yes. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, let me wrap the show. Everybody, this is Brent M. Bailey. Please, please, please go check out his stuff. And then if you pull into, oh, and if you pull into Shell Station and take your picture and you tag him, he'll retweet you. Yeah. You, uh, you can tag, uh, hashtag that Shelfie. Yes. Oh, is that a thing now? Shelfie? Yeah, Shelfie. So uh, we, when, we, when I first got the job, um, I, I, it was actually my idea. I pitched it to Shell and then we were at the, um, the Old Manhattan Car Museum, which is where they introduced me and People Magazine was there and they were like, oh, that's cool. And they ran, ran a whole story on it. So a bunch of people ended up doing it and it was just a fun way to, you do a selfie with me in the background. So you're doing yes. a shelfie because it's at the Shell gas station. I don't remember putting the shelfie part. Now I have to redo it. Now you got to redo it. Damn it. That's all right. It'll be cool. But uh, please, check, please check out LBJ. Like again, we'll put all the links at the bottom. Uh, so this is Michael Cologne with Mimosas with Michael. You can find us on Stitcher Radio, we're on Anchor, Spotify, Our Heart Radio, um, YouTube. Now I'm posting everything on Instagram Live, so you'll find us everywhere. Please check out the show. Again, everybody, Brent Bailey. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.